Hi, Sean. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for taking the time. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcasts. You are Sean Nichols, professor of philosophy at the University of Arizona. In fact, I think you actually have a title. You are the Sherwin Scott Professor of Philosophy, which distinguishes you from all of the other professors of philosophy at the University of Arizona. I assume you remind them of that every once in a while. Oh, yeah. That you're special. Um, you've written a couple of books published by Oxford University Press. One is called Bound, Essays on Free Will and Responsibility, and we're going to uh, start off by talking about that. Uh, the other is called Sentimental Rules on the Natural Foundations of Moral Judgment. Now, we're taping this uh, the day before Thanksgiving, and on Thanksgiving Day, millions of Americans will ask themselves the question, should I have another piece of pie? <laughs> a much smaller number of Americans will ask themselves the question of, wait, do I even have a choice in the matter? These are the people we refer to as philosophers. <laughs> and, and, and to put a finer point on the question they'll be asking, they'll be asking, I mean, they'll say, after all, if I believe in a universe comprehensively governed by causal laws, then presumably the forces that will determine whatever I'm about to do with respect to this pie were already in motion. So where is the room for free will? This is, this is the question they will ask. I think more Americans should ask themselves this question. And, I am, and this is what I hope to accomplish. I, I hope that, that, that after our conversation, uh, Americans will reflect on the, the presupposition that they have any choice in the matter to begin with. Is mm -hmm. that okay with you? Yeah. I mean, I think that there are benefits to thinking about it that way and there are benefits to just ignoring it and going on with life. So I think it, it's... Um... Okay, listen, it's been nice talking to you, Sean. <laughs> I, th I think you've solved the whole... Uh, but, but go ahead. Well, I think that you're right that most people don't think about... Um, they don't um, reflectively think about the problem that that determinism or some kind of causal comprehension poses for the way they think about free will. But first of all, I think it's completely available to them. I mean, I think that it's not like this is some big um, philosophical conundrum that was invented at Oxford and Harvard. Every single normally intelligent person can understand the problem. It doesn't take, it doesn't take years of mathematics to get an undergraduate to understand it. It takes two minutes. Um, so I think that it's, it's really there and easy to trigger. And I think that it's, you know, a, an important point of philosophical discovery for an individual to recognize it. Okay. Now let's, um, let's start out uh, with a question based on a, on a thing you wrote for Scientific American called Is Free Will an Illusion? And we will uh, link to that. And you talk about the way a lot of philosophers would think about the question uh, of, of free will. They would say there's actually only two options. Either our behavior is determined, we live in this mechanistic universe, the influences on our behavior are already set in motion, uh, and so what, what, whether you're going to have that piece of pie is inevitable, whether you know it or not, whether you're not you think you have a choice, there's that option. And then these philosophers would say the only other option is that it's random whether you will, uh, whether you will have that piece of pie it's like the flip of a coin. And, and, and that, most people would say, is not what they mean by free will, by having a meaningful choice. Right. Uh, and, and you go on to say, uh, our intuitions about free will, however, challenge this nihilistic view. Now, so I want to start out by asking why, what you mean by the word nihilistic and why you think it's a nihilistic view to, to confine the possibilities to either determinism or randomness. Um, well, if those are the two possibilities, it seems like neither of them is going to give us what we want. So what we want when we think about free will is something that, I mean, there's controversy about this too, of course, but I think that what we want for free will is for determinism to be false, um, but for it to be something that's not completely random either. So if it's either of those options, it seems like it's not what we want. We don't want it to be the case that what we do is inevitable. We also don't want it to be the case that what we do is completely random. So neither of those presents us with something that is satisfying to what we want from free will. Now, of course, other philosophers think that um, we have this other special thing that's neither determined nor random. 
But then when you press and you ask for details on it, it's always something that just seems like it's either utterly mysterious or utterly implausible. Um, right. well, me. So in other words, free will is on the one hand something we all kind of naturally feel we have, but then when you try to clearly conceive of right. it being in play, like that it gets fuzzy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just to, to pursue a little footnote here, a little tangent, uh, in a way, randomness is the same way. I mean, I mean, right. Because, uh, you know, we all think, well, a random thing is like when you flip a coin, that's random. On the other hand, we all also kind of think most of us that actually, if you understood all of the forces in play when you flip the coin, the wind yeah. direction, the air pressure, the velocity of the flip, you would actually be able to predict the coin. So actually, it's not that easy to conceive of randomness, right? Right. That's yeah, an intuition that's... too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the coin flip one, it's clearly the case that there's some deterministic story to be told there. You can build a machine that will reliably flip heads. Um, but it seems like, you know, when you ask people why something happened, they think there's going to be an explanation. And this is part of the reason why the um, attempt to give an account of free will is so fraught, because if you want to say, oh, I did this thing in a way that's not determined, and then you say, well, explain to me why you did it. People will think there has to be some reason. It's not like they think, oh, at that point, it's just, no, I just did it for no reason at all. Um, if there isn't a reason, it just seems bizarre. And so I think that this the drive to determinism, to think that there has to be some kind of causal explanation, is also very natural for us. We just naturally think that there has to be an explanation. Right. Um, and we should I, pause, I think, and say that you are uh, part of maybe a growing number of philosophers who take seriously this field of so-called experimental philosophy uh, mm -hmm. to and looking at doing experiments to figure out what people's intuitions about things are. Right. And then integrating that into arguments that you yourself make about free will and how we should think about free will and your position. We should also just a modest uh, version of a plot spoiler. We should say is an interesting position in that it's not, uh, you don't come down in a certain sense on either side of the traditional view that either it's determinism or it's free will, can't be both, and here's the one I'm choosing. That's not your position. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll spoil the plot to at least that extent, okay? And now let's, let's get back to examining um, people's intuitions. So, and let's get to, to that intuition that actually you have to choose. It's, it's either free will or it's determinism, Mm -hmm. And and you you explore why it is you think uh, that people see these two sides of the question and then see them as incompatible. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think that just interest for when for the free will side of it, just introspectively, when you think about making a decision like the decision about, like, say, raising my hand or taking a drink of water. It certainly doesn't seem like there are enough forces to explain what I can see inside doesn't uniquely pick out what will happen. And I think that's just true. Introspectively, what I see when I look in is not sufficient to predict exactly what I will do. And so then then it can seem really easy to think, oh, well, that must mean that there isn't any sort of determining story about what I will do. So I think that's one side of it. That's why we get this sense that there's there, there's more to be told about that. But that's why we get the sense of not having causal inevitability to our actions, I think. But because, then on the because other... we don't we don't understand all the forces in play. And we clearly don't, right? I mean modern psychology tells us that there are unconscious influences or, or unconsciously mediated influences right. that we're just not aware of. Right. And so one explanation of why we think there's free will is just because we're not aware of all the, the forces that are actually in play. Right, right. So I mean they're they're it's a little more, I think it has to be a little more complicated than that, though. So part of it is that I don't, what, every, what I see inside isn't determinative of what I do. But, but that's true about lots of things. Like, um, there are lots of things that I, um, I don't see the causal underpinnings of, but I don't draw an indeterminist conclusion. Like most things in the world, I don't see that how it actually works. I think when it comes to, th this part of the view, I think, is a little... Um, 
um, co- controversial, but when I introspect and I see that I don't know all the call to determinants, there must be some kind of presupposition that, well, I expect that I would know them. I would be, have access to them. And one, one way that this seems to have some support is we're surprised when we learn about all of these unconscious processes that, that produce our behavior or influence our behavior. And the fact that we're surprised indicates that, well, we, we thought that we would know that stuff. Um, so in the domain of our own internal mental lives, we expect to have a kind of complete understanding of what's going on in a way that we don't when it comes to, say, the orbit of the moon or something like that. Right. So we, we see the moon orbiting. We know we, we don't have any idea of what the actual forces in play are, and yet we assume it's determined. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But we don't do that for ourselves when we look inside and we don't and, see and, 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 and what's our stance toward other people? I mean, in a certain sense, we always, we, we, we always say, why did right. the person do that? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But then is the explanation we expect a deterministic explanation per se, or is it more like what part of their free will, you know? I think that once you start thinking about explanations for behavior, then already you're sort of on the path of thinking about it in this deterministic way. Um, mm-hmm. This is true even for your past self. But but when you I mean, this is the I, I said this before, but the libertarians, the people who think that there is the special free will that's neither deterministic nor random. When you say, well, tell me why it is that you did it. Why? So they say there was this purely free choice. I chose to do A rather than B. And you say, well, why did you do that? And the most sophisticated of them say, well, if there was an answer to that, then I wouldn't be a libertarian. I can't have a further explanation for why I made this discrimination. There might, that's a point at which there's no further explanation. But we naturally find that really unsatisfying. We think that, well, there must be some reason why. You know, maybe you like the one thing just a little bit more than the other thing. Um, mm-hmm. And so we think that there should be some kind of story. Um, and we should say that libertarian has a different meaning in this context than in the political one. Although maybe they're not quite totally unrelated. I suspect most political libertarians have a pretty robust belief in free will because they're very happy for people to inherit the consequences of their action. And, and, and that that tends to be uh, associated with a belief in free will. That doesn't necessarily have to be, but it tends to be. Right, right. I mean, there are lots of different kinds of political libertarians, it yeah. turns out, I, I've learned recently. Um, and some of them wouldn't like people who follow Hayek and think that the issue is complexity. They wouldn't care about the free will stuff at all. They wouldn't mm-hmm. think that that was that bore on the issue. But um. OK, let me let me uh, ask you one one more question about our intuition about free will. Uh, as you know, I have a certain weakness for uh, evolutionary psychology. And, uh, you know, the way the evolutionary psychologist might think about this is, well, if we have the intuition of free will, maybe that's like an adaptation. In other words, that's something that was favored by natural selection. So it was in the, it, it kind of served the genetic interests of our ancestors to believe that they had this thing about free will and to go about and to go around talking about it that way. I mean, maybe the ultimate payoff was that if they could go around saying, well, I did this because of this and I did this, you know, I made this choice because of that, that would explain, uh, you know, if that had benefits in terms of our getting genes in the next generation, maybe that explains uh, both why we have the belief in free will and why we actually turn out not to be privy to certain of the actual explanations mm. about why we did things. Is that something that gets considered in philosophy much? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I like lots of evolutionary psychology, too, but I think that the free will belief, the kind that we're talking about, is so sophisticated in a way because it's it's the denial of a sophisticated view about like determinism um and that isn't really even articulated by people and so the the notion of free will that's problematic is something that gets brought out through reflection i mean i think people are tacitly committed to it in a way but but i don't think it's I don't think that like deterministic theory could be plausibly innate. And so it wouldn't have been something that was heritable. Um, and I don't think that the denial of it would be either. So I, I'm an evolutionary explanation here doesn't seem promising for this particular belief about free will, the kind, the one that's at odds with determinism. Okay. So, um, one more thing maybe we should underscore and we've alluded to before we get to your position is that uh, 
traditionally people associate a belief in free will with a belief in moral responsibility. In yeah. other words, and this is why a lot of people worry about the notion of free will being eroded, is that mm-hmm. they think that if you uh, don't believe that people did things of their own free will, including bad things, then you can't punish them for it. It's not morally just to punish them right. for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and and also it's not particularly just for people to uh, f- to be rewarded for their, for their good behavior. Um, so... Uh, and, and this is uh, one thing you're you're addressing. I mean, certainly in the end, you do have a position that you think of as consistent with punishing people for bad behavior, right? Yeah, yeah. And and but... and and then you get to this position by addressing uh, the issue of incompatibilism. And relatedly, the issue of compatibilism. Incompatibilism, again, is, is the idea that um, you have to choose. Either it's deterministic or people have free will, right? Uh, compatibilism mm-hmm. is the view that, uh, which is counterintuitive to most of us, that actually you don't have to choose. It, you can yeah. believe in a deterministic universe and believe in free will in a meaningful sense. Now... Yeah. Uh, are you are you a thoroughgoing compatibilist? Oh, or, not or, at all. No. You're not. But but you believe, and, and yet you're kind of a you're not a thoroughgoing incompatibilist, right? Well, I mean, so I think that I, I agree with you that compatibilism is counterintuitive. Although lots of philosophers don't hold that view, um, the most philosophers, certainly most philosophers of free will, are compatibilists. This is the this is the dominant view in the profession. But I think that that it requires denying this really fundamental sense we have of the conflict that we have when we're 18. You know, when we first hear the pro- it's not like very few undergraduates when you introduce the problem say, oh, that's no problem. These two things are totally fine together. They're totally consistent. So there's some kind of intuitive resistance to that. And I think that I mean. I don't think we should just throw that out. I don't think we should ignore that. I don't think they're being confused. Lots of philosophers think that undergraduates are confused to think that there's a, it's inconsistent. I don't think that's the case at all. I think that there's some deep tension in the way we think about ourselves. But then, so that's one, that's a fact about, um, about our, our outlook on our action and our outlook on morality as well, I think, that we have this view about moral responsibility. So I take that to be one point, like that's an incom- strong incompatibilist intuition. It's not, I don't think there's any mistake that's being made there. That's really the way we think of ourselves. But then you have other concerns in life. Um, and it's those other concerns that I think can can provide reason to say, maybe we should, even though we have this incompatibilist strand in our thought, Maybe there are these other strands in our thought that can outweigh it, at least in some cases. Okay. Like worrying about like um, ensuring that people behave. And so you might think that treating people as if they're morally responsible has a lot of benefits. And so we should take those into account when we're trying to decide ultimately how to think about free will and responsibility. Maybe we want to adopt a view that doesn't really fit completely with common sense. Right. Uh, maybe... Maybe one way to look at this is is that there are actually two versions of compatibilism. One is that determinism is compatible with free will, and I want to stop and explore that in just one second. But you could also say that if you don't believe that, you still believe that determinism is compatible with the notion of moral responsibility. Yeah, that's another kind of compatibilism, and, right. And, yeah. and are you a compatibilist in that sense? No, um, what I think is that in lots of cases, I'm not a, I think compatibilism um, requires that you, the, the way the traditional notion of compatibilism requires that you think that there is genuine consistency between determinism and free will or determinism and moral responsibility. And I don't think that there is. I think that there's a fundamental tension between those ideas. And so the kind, the, the view that I have is, there are other people who have these kinds of views as well, is that even though there is no like easy consistency, we have to give up something here. We either have to give up the practice of moral responsibility or we have to give up our conviction that moral responsibility is inconsistent with determinism. And what I say at least is that a lot of the time what we should do is suppress that incompatibilist intuition and, and go along with the practices. The, the intuition of incompatibilism between determinism and moral responsibility. Yeah, yeah right. right. 
Okay. So we'll we'll explore that uh, in in a minute. But first, let's explore uh, compatibilism in the sense of uh, compatibilism between determinism and free will. Because I, I I'm kind of surprised to hear you say that's a majority view among philosophers. Because it, it I mean, again, I share the common intuition. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but that that uh, of incompatibilism, but also uh, I, I've tried to confront this intuition. You know, I did read Dan Dennett's book *Freedom Evolves*, yeah. which was an argument for compatibilism, and right. and I don't I don't even remember the details of his argument in favor of it. What I do remember is thinking at the end, he's arguing for a conception of free will that is just not of interest to most people. In yeah. the end, the version of free will that's compatible with determinism is not what people actually mean by free will. Uh, maybe philosophers mean it, but that may not be a compliment to philosophers if that's what <laughs> they mean, because it's not what people care about. Yeah. Now, so can you explain to us what people like Dennett who believe in compatibilism, what do they mean by saying that you can believe in a completely determined universe and still believe you have free will? Well, you know, there are lots of different theories of it, and the details are, I mean, the, the tales are probably too, um, there's too much minutia there to go into. But the, um, the basic idea is that once you understand what free will really is, um, then you'll see that it's completely consistent. So a really simple early version that has all kinds of problems is just that free will is being able to do what you want, not being constrained. But then there are lots of counterexamples to that um, where you think that, well... So, so let me, can I just pause and say, so what you want could have been determined. Exactly. Right. But it's and that's not why it's consistent. But yeah. but then what does constrained mean? Because because uh, I mean, I almost think what they mean is it's not conspicuously constrained. It's not like somebody walking up and holding a gun to your head and saying, "You can't do this." Right. When in fact, there already were constraints. They were just so subtle you didn't appreciate them. Yeah, well, think one way to try to, I mean, I don't have a lot of sympathy with those views either, but one way to try to get in the space is to think, well, how do we ordinarily use the word free? Well, we talk about when so, whether somebody has a gun to their head or when somebody has some kind of pressure in some other way, some kind of external pressure or they're in jail. And we talk about and then we say, oh, you're free now. Um, so you were free to do this, meaning nobody was constraining you externally. And so if you think those just if you just think about those instances of hearing the word free, you might think, oh, well, that's what people are going to index the word to. It's going to be when you're not physically constrained. And so then you think, so that must really be what free will means is not being physically constrained. Now, I think that that particular view collapses very quickly. Um, because people can have compulsions that aren't external and you still think they're unfree because of the compulsions. Mm -hmm. So then you need something more sophisticated yet. And then, then philosophers are off to the races trying to develop the best account that you can't give a counterexample to. Um, But it's all, you might think it's all grounded in, well, what's the normal way we use the word free? And if it turns out that it's a word that doesn't refer to anything, then that seems like a problem because we should be able to explain what it means. Um, so in a way, are they saying that um, <clears throat> I, I still don't get what I still don't get what their conception of free will is in the end after they've entertained the kinds of objections I'm starting to raise? Yeah, well, they'll say that those objections just don't touch it because you're working with a conception of free will that is not the is not the conception that people have that, that philosophers have. Um, I mean, in a way, I'm not the best person to run this case because I don't believe the view. Right. But that's the sort of inspiration. If you think about what are the normal uses of it, um, how can we systematize the normal uses and say what the meaning would be given the normal uses? And the normal uses will not involve determinism because that's too sophisticated a notion. Mm-hmm. So in a way, they're saying... Uh, the the common sense notion of freedom may be confused, but mm-hmm. <laughs> let's let people have it. I I don't know. It, it's it's just uh and, well we we need we need uh pursue this. Um, well, I don't think it, I don't think I want to say one thing more about that. I don't think they have to say that the common sense view is confused. What they can say is the common sense view is the view that's given by ordinary uses of the word free mm-hmm. when show up. And then those ordinary uses, they won't involve determinism, it seems like, because people don't talk about determinism. That never comes up in ordinary conversations. So that's one way that a compatibilist could, that's a sort of old school compatibilist approach. 
This is a totally obscure footnote question, but I know there is something called ordinary language philosophy, right? Yeah. Is this an example of that? Yeah, this would be an example of that. Okay, right. well, more reason to be for me to be skeptical of it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, l okay, so let's get on to the, uh, the your, your actual view of the situation. Um, you can pick up wherever you want. We've covered a certain amount of ground, but as you start explaining... Um, the sense in which you want to reconcile uh, notions of moral responsibility mm -hmm. with at least the possibility of the truth of determinism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you generally explain it? Well, so it's, I think of it, I don't think of it so much in terms of compatibility as in terms of like, there's a competition between two things that we have, two things we're committed to. We're committed to incompatibilism and we're committed to moral responsibility. And then you think about your everyday life. And I, I say this in one of the chapters, but, you know, I've been a hard determinist, of, like a no free will person since I was 19 years old. As soon as I started thinking about it, it seemed like you had to be like, it was bad faith to think that we had free will. You just weren't facing the problem. And I still have that sort of feeling about compatibilists sometimes that they're just like, they're just ignoring the obvious fact that we don't have free will. But it's also true that I've always held my friends responsible for their actions. I've always held like my partners responsible, my kids responsible for their actions. So I didn't let that anti free will view in it sort of infuse my everyday life. Um, and then I just, it just seems like, well, maybe it's okay. Like maybe that living your life, in which you living a life in which you hold people responsible is just a better life than one in which you're constantly saying, oh, this person's actions were determined, um, which seems like it would be so terrible for a relationship, for instance. Like you just think, oh, my partner did this terrible thing to me, but she's determined and it's inevitable. And so I'm not going to be mad. I'm not going to blame her. I'm not going to hold her responsible. That seems like a kind of a terrible way to have a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, OK, so maybe I should ask you to distinguish your view from my view if there's a distinction my view is that punishment is a regrettable necessity so it, it, it's like uh, obviously society would fall apart if we did not hold people responsible for their behavior including right. rewarding you know, some good behavior yeah, uh, and, right. and, and, and punishing some bad behavior uh, so I mean why don't we why don't we uh contextualize this with a, a very current example. All of these men, uh, prominent men, are suddenly uh, seeing their careers dissolve in the face of allegations of sexual harassment, inappropriate behavior, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, on the one hand, that is as it should be. I mean, th this is bad behavior, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's good for it to be punished. It's especially good for prominent people to be punished because you get more bang per buck. Everybody sees it. Yeah. Right. And, right. And you could say that's unfair on a couple of grounds. Why should the prominent, you know, be, be, uh, absorb a disproportionate share of the suffering and also just the there, but for the grace of God argument, which I take <laughs> seriously. It's like, I've never been in the position of power that Charlie Rose was in. I, <laughs> I've never faced the kinds of temptations he faces. It, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, who knows? It, it's a it's a um, how I would react if I did. Uh, and there's a number of other factors I could things I, I could point to that I don't share with all these um, with all these people. Uh, and yet I think they should be punished. And, and it seems to me there's there's something to be said. For tr it, it's not that easy to, on the one hand, feel a kind of sympathy for people and say they should be punished. But right. it seems to me there's something. Um, laudable about the effort and and, yeah. but that, but, and first of all do you agree but also that's not quite your view is it well uh no it isn't i do agree that it's it's easy when you think about like classic cases of punishment theory and what what liberals like the the liberal view that i always held was that when you, you think about the criminal and you think about what they're going through, and when you focus on that, it really seems like, well, why are you doing that to them? If it's not going to help anything, if it doesn't have any positive consequences, why would you do it? You justify it only on the basis of positive consequences. And it's easy when you think about the person who is being, um, who's undergoing the suffering, it's very easy to put yourself in that sympathetic perspective, I think. Um, but, you know, in, in the stuff that 
I write about, I try not to talk about the criminal law because there are so many other complications there. Like does this, you know, it's state sponsored punishment. The kinds of punishment that we do are pretty questionable. Um, and so, I mean, there are issues there that I don't try to address, but I think about it in everyday life with the people that you love and there, it seems like to treat them from the objective attitude, say, oh, you know, this person is just like, they're just a machine and they do what they do because of determinism and some randomness. Um, that would be a very odd way to interact with a loved one. And, mm -hmm. and to say, oh, you know, she, um, she did this thing, she insulted me in front of these other people. And I'm just like, oh, well, you know, she's determined, insult it was inevitable that she was gonna insult me or be like, you know, you can't do that. Like, you can't insult me. That's not appropriate. Um, whether you confront somebody about something and treat them as though they had some control over it. It seems like that is a, a healthier kind of relationship than one that just treats somebody from the objective view. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, one, as long as you mentioned the law, let me just mention a, a, a legal question that does kind of crystallize something important important here about the question, which is that in American law, as I understand it, there are, you know, formal rationales for punishment in jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. And they include pragmatic ones like you'll keep the person off the streets if they're if they're in jail, they can't kill again. And then deterrence, other people will see that they're in jail and they won't kill people. So those mm -hmm. are pragmatic. But I think there's also still in American law, a retributive rationale for punishment. Yeah. So right. So the thought experiment that 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 does crystallize this is suppose you found out that off on a desert island somewhere, there is someone who committed a war crime long ago. Yeah, it's you, you have the choice to punish them in some way. No one will ever know that you did it. So it right. will, uh, whether you did it or not, no one will ever know that they even exist. So it will have no practical consequence should you do it. My view, I think, is that you shouldn't because it's gratuitous mm -hmm. suffering. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, I think maybe your view is different. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that when I, the stuff on retributivism that I've written about, I try to, um, I try to pull back the drama from it and just think about some really simple interaction um, with an, a regular person who does something unfair. So in the stuff I've written on, I focus on economic games because those are so well studied, they're so well controlled. So in a typical game, you'd have something like two strangers play and one of them, um, this is called the trust game, one of them is given some money and he can transfer that money to the other person and that will be tripled. And then the other person gets to decide how much of it to give back. So you entrust, the first person trusts the other player with his money that will then be tripled and then the other player has to give some back. Well, so imagine a scenario where this happens a lot, where the first player entrusts the money to the second one, and the second one gives nothing back. And now imagine you're an observer of this, and you have an opportunity to punish that second guy. Um, even, let's say, you have an opportunity to punish him, and he'll never know. He has some extra money that, coming that he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. You might think, Sh is, it, you know, is there something so bad about taking a couple dollars from that guy? And like burning him, not taking him for yourself, just getting rid of a couple dollars. It seems to me like... What's the big deal? Like, of course I can do that. He did a shitty thing, and it's okay if you take some money away from him. Um, like, you I'm know, guessing that this particular line has never appeared in a philosophical paper of yours. What's the big <laughs> deal? He did a shitty thing. I assume you put it in different ways when you're not talking to me, but I prefer this way. I have to say, this is more accessible. Yeah, I think Oxford cut that part out. Yeah, um, yeah but, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that in those cases, when you think about, like, most of the punishment that we engage in in everyday life is probably pretty minor. It's things like um, scolding someone or or um, neglecting someone, um, mm -hmm. not paying attention to them, not saying hi to them, you know, things like that, little things. Um, it's not you're, you're not putting them in prison. Um, and so these little bits of punishment, I think, that we do that might might be retributive. I, I think that we get caught up with this fetishization of how bad pain is and how bad suffering is and just like. I just took a dollar from him. That's all I did. He treated somebody unfairly and I took a dollar from him um, because he treated somebody unfairly. That seems fine to me, I guess. Yeah, but does it seem fine? Um, because actually, almost whenever you do it, it's having a good practical consequence. <laughs> well, that could be. I mean, it could be that there's some broader justification for why we have the practice in the first place. That's right. Um, but then I just continue with the practice in this relatively unreflective way um, because I'm committed to the practice. Yeah. But the reason we have the practice 
probably is because it has these good consequences overall. Oh, I think, and I mean, to get back to evolutionary psychology, right? Uh, they would say absolutely. Now, they would also say, though, that the impulse did not, uh, like the retributive impulse, did not evolve to serve the greater good per se. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it uh, you know, because that's not the way evolution works. It works, uh, it, you know, traits, uh, genetically based traits that get your genes into the next generation um, are the traits that survive. So a retributive impulse, if it's genetically based, had to do that. On the other hand, by virtue of like the non-zero sum dynamics that there are in a society, um, it turns out that uh, a, a society in, in which people have the urge to punish uh, people who do things that are perceived as bad, even beyond what they've done, you know, even beyond your perspective, um, and that is the way it seems seems to work uh, for what evolutionary psychologists would call explicable reasons. Um, that's a better society, to, mm-hmm. you know. And, mm-hmm. and, and so, so the right. idea that that good good turns should be rewarded and bad turns should be punished um, is, I think they would say it's a, it's an intuition that served genetic proliferation, and it's a fortunate thing yeah. that uh, the world is constructed such that. It tends, doesn't right. in, 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 unerringly, uh, but it tends to serve a kind of a greater good. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's plausible. I would put it in terms of emotions, probably that you have these. You have anger, for instance, which is surely an adaptation. Um, well, I mean, I think it's an adaptation, and that serves as a check on being mistreated. Um, it also serves as a check on other people, other people being mistreated. And so it has this good consequence of, you know, you, you react to someone who treats you badly because of the emotion of anger. And then that makes it less likely that you'll be treated badly in the future. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, there's moralistic anger and maybe you could argue that anger tends almost to always be that, but it's an interesting feature of human beings that, you know, when you feel angry towards someone, you're, you're, you are, are developing in the process an argument against them. It's like if somebody says to you, why are you angry? You're yeah. ready. You have something that they did wrong. Right. Usually, and this is interesting because I know you get into this, I think you get into this question of perspective taking. A, well, the, the whole issue of arguing from a perspective other than your own. In other words, mm-hmm. you, you will say, on the one hand, you'll say they hurt me. Yeah. That's why I'm angry. But you'll also, we tend to argue from a, a higher a higher perspective, uh, you know, with, with reference to some corn, kind of universal uh, truth about the badness of harming people gratuitously, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that that's right. Um, and, and that's, and, and, and you like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay, so we've, uh, we talked about some kind of official, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, I guess graphs along which you can graph people's views in the realm of fi- philosophy. There's, in, there's compatibilism and incompatibilism with respect to free will versus determinism, with respect to determinism versus moral culpability. I, I, to get back to this philosophical framework for talking about things, where do you position yourself and how do you differ? Uh, because I think your view is somewhat distinctive. How do you differ from a lot of common views in philosophy? Well, I think so there, the first place is, and there are, there are other people who have this kind of view like Manuel Vargas that acknowledges that we have this incompatibilist intuition, but then says that that's not the end of the day. That, that doesn't finish the story. Then you decide what to do in light of the fact that we have this tension between our practice in our commitment to incompatibilism. And then one strand of the work that I did was to say, at least for part of our lives, we should just, instead of giving up the practice, we should give up, we should suppress the intuition. I don't think we can really give it up. I think the intuition is sort of, it's always there. Just like a lot of what happens in early childhood, a lot of you know, our assumptions about the way agents work, that stuff is just there forever. It can be triggered in other kinds of experiments. I think we're just, we just have this deep sense in which, incompatibilism is right. 
But then in our, in our everyday practices, I think often the right thing to do is just stick with them. On the other hand, sometimes it's true that the ordinary conception of ourselves, I think, Bill has a has an in, sort of internally has this incoherent element, or at least this false element of this belief in free will. And sometimes it's good to remind yourself of that. Like, so I think sometimes you want to remind yourself, like when things are, when you do something that you think is really bad or unforgivable, or you you fail for somebody in some really significant way, and you you can't fix a problem, you might think, well, you might take comfort in the idea that, well, this all was something that really wasn't a product of free will. In some sense, it was either inevitable or random. There was a, an important way in which I really didn't have control over that. I mean, I think that that's true, that we don't really have control over those things. And so sometimes it can, I think, be a useful therapeutic device to appeal to the truth that we actually don't have the kind of free will that we think we do. Right. And of course, it can, in principle, do damage. I mean, you can you can use uh, a belief in determinism to say I had no choice. I'm just going to go around doing bad things or I'm going to keep, you know, overeating, taking drugs, whatever. Um, right. So is it almost situational? I mean, is it almost like uh, there are times when it's appropriate to have to to, to cater to to follow one intuition yeah. and times when it's appropriate to follow another intuition? Yeah, that's the story that I suggest at the end of the book um, that um, and I, what you you raise a worry, right? Because you might think, well, then, you know, you can just use it strategically for bad ends. Um, mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's true. Maybe that's how it, maybe that's how it would happen. But I think that insofar as we have this tension between these two ways of thinking about ourselves um, and and in some cases, at least, it seems like it would just be so undermining to adopt the radical no free will view that would un that would undercut anger that would undercut the sense of like deep gratitude for what somebody does for you that you have in your normal relationships to give all that up just seems like so much to give up um and so i don't want to i don't want to be saddled with the position of saying oh i have an in incompatible intuition therefore i'm going to throw out most of my moral practices mm -hmm. um, that just seems too extreme it seems too, it seems like it's dangerous for all sorts of reasons but at the same time, there are occasions when, you know, you fail at something and, and you need some kind of you, thinking about the fact that it was determined can provide some kind of solace that's totally legitimate. Um, so that's part of why I think that it's OK to appeal to that in cases of failure. You think, well, it really is true that what happened there was inevitable. Right. And maybe especially if you're uh, prone to pathological self-chastisement. Yes, exactly. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I read that, you know, this this was a therapy at one point in the 60s. People with the, the um, clinic or cognitive behavioral psychologists or therapists would say, realize that what you did was inevitable given the past. So you shouldn't feel guilty about it. You shouldn't feel so bad about it because mm -hmm. it's not something that you had genuine total control over, true control over. Right. Now, in theory, that would undermine your self-satisfaction when you do something good. And yeah. maybe that's it. Who knows if that's a good thing? There's such a thing as too much self-satisfaction. But yeah. in theory, it would work in both directions. But I assume these therapists uh, applied this surgically. I think probably so. Not yeah. globally. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it, one th one interesting thing is how academics, some people might consider this question in the sense that uh, one interesting thing is that even if you are very aware of how much sense determinism makes intuitively right mm -hmm. uh and, and even if you say well yeah that's what i believe i mean given the fact that i see the whole world out there is operating deterministically i guess it makes sense to apply that to myself so really my actual professed explicit belief is determinism even as it applies to me even if you say all that it's actually you, you wind up going through life you, you know you actually can't apply that comprehensively yeah. somebody does something that upsets you and you right. think that's a jerk who deserves to be punished. Somebody does yeah. something nice and you feel gratitude. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, how uh, is, is this a sheerly academic in that sense question? Or do you? Uh, I mean, there are certainly people who wrestle with it. It influences their lives, right? Right, right. I don't think it's purely academic for the reason that you brought up at the very beginning. I mean, I, I, I think that 
people should recognize this. People should know. I mean, because another way in which I think it's appropriate to remind people about determinism and get them to appreciate the absence of free will is because it, it makes them less superior. Like people feel so morally superior to others and you think it's just a matter of circumstance. And so you said the thing about, you know, there but for the grace of God. Of course, that's true for all of us. And I think that we need to recognize that, especially in cases where, well, yeah, especially in cases where we're actually going to punish people and we're deciding to, pun to ex you know, produce serious harm on a person. Um, when you remember that it's just it's it's just a matter of some kind of quirk of the past, some some luck that I had that I'm not in a similar situation. Um, I just think that that's important for people to appreciate. And I think it's available to people. I mean, when I teach this stuff, students will it's not like it doesn't get under their skin. They recognize it. They try to grapple with it by saying things like, oh, but some people under hard circumstances don't do that. You know, right. um, so it doesn't show that it's determined. And you think, well, you know, there may have been other differences. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, it's like, if you say to, I mean, in the, the argument you're you're kind of suggesting is, if you say to someone who's done well in life, well, were you privileged? Did you start out privileged? Well, in some sense, according to this view, the answer has to be yes. There, yeah. there were, you know, some combination of genes and environment put them on this path, right. you know, on which they encountered other influences that collectively led to right. where they are. And, and, yeah. and, and so it's almost uh, tautological in this view to say that a successful person was privileged. Right, right. And it, and it, and I agree. It'd be nice if more successful people kept that possibility in mind. Yeah, uh, yeah. I um, mean, it's funny how it's a little hard. You know, you can feel like you look at people who don't work very hard. You know, in your own job, and you look at people who don't work very hard. It's so easy to to you know blame them and think, well, you know, that person should be doing more, um, and and maybe feel a little bit of like professional um, contempt or something really distasteful like that. And and then if you can step back and say, but wait, you know, uh, uh, I could have done that. That could have been me. There's not like right. that. Um, of course, the people who really bother me are the ones who don't work very hard and are more successful than I am. <laughs> <laughs> this is by far the most obnoxious combination of traits. <laughs> um, okay, so so to to uh, so you are you are not a compatibilist in the sense that you think free will and determinism. Are compatible you are a compatibilist in the sense that you think one can take determinism seriously even be a determinist and preserve robust notions of moral responsibility that's right yeah that's right um, um preserve the practices anyway i mean the thing is that i still think there always is this deep resistance intuitively that we have to it and i don't think that goes away um and so but i do think that we can continue the right thing to do is to continue the practices the thing is that if you think of it in terms of a competition, something has to go. You either have to like, you either have to um, suppress the intuition, or you have to change the practices. It's not like it's not like there's some um, happy medium here, and so you have to make a decision about which is more important. And you might think that well, that intuition matters, but it isn't everything that matters. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let me um, close uh, with a. Uh, uh, Another kind of footnote question, but I think an interesting one. Um, we talked about uh, determinism and randomness being alternatives uh, that are, uh, according to many philosophers, that's all that's left. They don't take free will seriously, so it's either uh, determined or it's random. And we talked about the, the, the fact that actually when you start thinking thinking about true randomness, that doesn't comply with our intuitions either, because we always think there's a reason the coin came down tails or heads. Right. But right. interestingly, quantum physics wants us to take the idea of true randomness seriously, right? I mean, the, the idea yeah. is that some, you know, is this uh, when a when a when a subatomic particle decays or whatever, is it, is it going to, so to speak, wind up heads or tails? Um, mm -hmm. They want to say that uh, well, there are outcomes for which there actually is no physical explanation in this universe, which right. is a, a, a kind of striking thing yeah. for a scientist to say. Right. Um, does that, I, I mean, first of all, is that interesting to you? Does that open up? I mean, to me, that's another reason to just say, ultimately, <laughs> you know, on free will and determinism and a lot of other things, I have to profess less than complete confidence in any 
thing in any view. But but uh, my my question is, first of all, d does is that a really interesting fact to you that physics says this? And secondly, is it being taken seriously in philosophy? Are they doing anything with it? Yeah, I mean, in, for the in free will, there is the I guess the most prominent person who defends libertarianism uses quantum theory to justify. It. But the worry, of course, and who, is, who is that, by the way? Bob Kane. Um, uh, he's at Texas. Uh, so. But but the worry, of course, is, and this is a worry that is pressed on him, and he recognizes it, is that it, that also just seems random. It doesn't seem like there's there isn't a self that's generating the quantum phenomena. Um, so that's how it's it's figured into the free will debate. But it's it's not easy to make to 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 like convert it into something that gets you to a libertarian result. No, but at the same time, the notion of an uncaused effect, <laughs> an uncaused thing. Mm -hmm. Is itself so counterintuitive, right? That that it could make you question all kinds of it, intuitions, including incompatibilism, or yeah. you know, or any number of other things. Yeah, that you know, that's interesting. I don't think people have run that particular line, but you're right that you might do that. The other thing that I was going to say about it is, of course, lots of, um, or at least there's a tradition in physics that rejects the indeterminist interpretation. Um, that and Einstein, this was the one that Einstein mm -hmm. favored, and people still, lots of philosophers of physics still favor the Bohmian account, which says that there's just some hidden variable. And there, you think, well, what's going on there? Well, it's not that they had like independent evidence for this. It's like there has to be a reason. So you get the same kind of drive for an explanation, I think, in those cases. Um, as you did the beginning of philosophy, you get these things like they knew nothing and they were like, well, there has to be a reason for everything. There has to be an explanation for everything, mm -hmm. even though they had so little scientific knowledge. Right. In fact, Einstein, uh, in explaining his view and to some extent, I guess the basis of his view said, God does not play dice. In other words, right. it's just not, <laughs> it's not my intuition that this is the way the universe is set up. Right. right. Um, I mean, there is apparently, uh, some experimental work that uh, the traditionalists in quantum physics, who the anti-determinists say is slowly foreclosing the possibility of determinism. It has to do with these uh, entanglement experiments. Mm -hmm. But um, but you're right. Okay. I, 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 I hear that, um, that, that, that the Einstein position is not totally dead. Right, right. So, well, listen, uh, thanks for taking the time. We, we didn't really get into your other book, Sentimental Rules, but maybe uh, if you have time uh, down the road, we could come back and talk about that. Uh, right. Because, it, 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 you know, it's not unrelated, and it's of great mm -hmm. interest to me, like why we have the moral views we have and what are moral views and so on. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but, but anyway, uh, thanks. Happy Thanksgiving. Well, well, let me, final question. Will this question actually arise as you sit yourself at the Thanksgiving table will, and you decide whether to have more food? Uh, let's see. So let's see. I'm having Thanksgiving with a, a Buddhist philosopher. So maybe. Oh, well, that's a whole nother. Uh, there, the Buddhist position on this deserves a whole nother conversation. Uh, it's it's very close to determine it. In fact, what I've been what I've heard is that actually Buddhism it's a very sophisticated philosophy, but it, it doesn't, um, maybe it's implicitly compatible. It's because on the one hand, it often seems very determinist, but mm -hmm. they don't deny free will ex in any explicit way. Yeah. I mean, there are people who write about this and argue both sides. So there are people who argue that Buddhism is fundamentally, um, against free will. Yeah. Um, I mean, if there's no self, it's hard to think of where the source of free will is. Right. That part is the, the account, the no, that, that account is, seems very determined, very deterministic. Yeah, no yeah, or any very um, no free will. -y. Um, right, right. So, and, and yeah. The, yeah, it's hard to see where where the free will is once you've yeah. done that analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, okay. anyway, enjoy your dinner uh, tomorrow, and uh, and thanks again, Sean. All right. Thanks, Bob. Bye bye. bye.